Welcome to your MBA in Leadership and Management with Aspire Business School. This module will focus on leadership styles. So by the end of the module, you will be able to identify different leadership styles and where they are best used. Now Goldman has presented us with a few different repertoires or styles of leadership. The first is visionary, so someone who sets a very clear vision is inspiring. The second is coaching, so somebody who's able to coach you through your job. The third is affiliative, the fourth is democratic, the fifth is pace setting, and the sixth is commanding. Now the first four are known as resonant. These are the ones are, that are known to work well. Now pace setting and commanding is known as dissonant, which effectively they're not recommended to be used all the time, but that doesn't mean that you can't use them. So a leader should ideally be able to apply every single type of repertoire that's listed here, depending on what's needed when it comes to leadership. So dissonant styles like pace setting and commanding are not necessarily discouraged all the time, but there are moments when they could be used. For example, in the military, the commanding style is used quite a lot, it's very effective for the military, so you have to apply these styles where you see fit as a leader. Now according to Goldman, when leaders are able, are able to drive emotions positively, so they're able to influence people, they bring out everyone's best. They're able to get the best performance out of their team when they positively influence their emotions. And this is called resonance. But when they drive emotions negatively, this can actually bring about some dissonance, which effectively means that you are bringing people down and people are not allowed to shine. So the key really in primal leadership, as Goldman presents it, is effectively how emotionally intelligent a leader is. So how they're able to manage their emotions and actually handle the emotions of others in order to get the job done. And they will use both resonance and dissonance styles of leadership in order to make that happen. Here's a question for you. As a leader, when you look at this glass of blue liquid on the screen, do you think it's half full or half empty? Now you could say that the glass is half full of water. Or you could say that there is an entire glass, but half of it is empty of water. Now there's no right answer to this, because depending on your perspective, you're, you're, you're either right or you're right. Now this theory is often used to determine whether somebody is a generally negative thinker or a generally positive thinker. So if you're a positive thinker, you will say the glass is half full. But if you're generally a negative thinker, you will say the glass is actually half empty. And what if we added more water to the glass? Is it now more full or less empty? Now, putting that exercise to one side for a second, let's have a look at what self-leadership is. So how are you able to lead yourself as an individual? There are nine key characteristics of what we call is a secure-based leader. The first is the ability to stay calm. So when you are in a stressful situation, how are you able to deal with that situation in a calm manner? The second characteristic of a secure-based leader is someone who is accepting of the individual. So when you're self-leading, how much do you accept yourself and every aspect of your character? The third characteristic is somebody who sees the potential. So when you look at your skills and your abilities, how far do you see the potential of what you're able to achieve? The fourth characteristic is that this person listens and is inquisitive. So when you are having a bad day or you're having a good day, are you listening to yourself? Are you listening to the voice in your head? Are you asking questions and approaching every issue with curiosity? The fifth characteristic of a secure based leader is somebody who delivers a powerful message. So when you want to convince yourself of doing something, how are you able to tell yourself in a powerful way that you should do that thing? The sixth characteristic of a secure based leader is somebody who focuses on the positive. So this is when you're Dealing with, a, with dealing with an adverse situation, how far are you able to focus on what's positive about that situation? The seventh characteristic 
is somebody who encourages risk taking. So when you are about to do or you're faced with something you've never done before, are you able to face that risk? The eighth characteristic is somebody who inspires through intrinsic motivation. So when you think about yourself and self-leadership, how, how far are you able to inspire yourself through looking at your values and your beliefs? And the ninth characteristic is of a secure based leader is somebody who signals accessibility. So how approachable is this person? How well are you able to just have a word with yourself? And I'm sure you'll see now that even though these six, sorry, these nine characteristics are looking at self-leadership, they're also the characteristics that you could use to become a leader of others. Now, when we look at the glass half full or glass half empty exercise, what aspect of secure based leadership can you use to address your, your reaction on whether the glass was half full or the glass was half empty? Now, looking at self-leadership in a bit more detail, this is Tedesi Abraham, who is a marathon runner. He is Swiss. And when you think of someone who runs a marathon, that's 42 kilometers of possibly constant running with a bit of walking in between if, if maybe uh, you get tired. But when you think of leading yourself and leading yourself through adversity, what do you think Mr. Abraham was thinking on the last 10 kilometers of a 42 kilometer race? How far was he able to inspire himself, give himself posit positive self-talk, to think of the outcome, to be able to handle adversity? How, what is going through his head as a leader of himself? And how far was he able to lead himself to the finish line? And in a similar situation yourself, how are you leading yourself? When you think of leadership styles, one of the classic theories is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. This has five key areas, and the theory here is that you have to pass through the base area and progress slowly towards the top. So the first need that you have to fulfill in your team or even yourself as a leader is physiological. So do you have enough food to eat? Do you have clean air to breathe? Do you have clean water to drink? Once you have that, the next element is safety. So where do you live? Um, is it safe where you live? Do you feel like you're in danger? Are you able to go about your life in a way that makes you feel like you can without any threats? Once you've achieved that, you then move into the next level, which is belonging. So who is in your social circle? Who do you connect to? What groups are you part of? And what is your identity? Once you have that, you move into the fifth level, which is, sorry, the fourth level, which is esteem. So how far do you believe in yourself? How far do you understand your values? And what is your self-worth? And the final and fifth element is self-actualization. This is when you often don't think of yourself as a self. You can see yourself from the outside. You've achieved the four different levels of your hierarchy of needs, and now you are a self-actualized person. So how can you apply this to yourself, where do you think you are in this hierarchy of needs from Maslow? Now, Springer gave us a theory on this that's based on the fact that motivating and lead, leading people in a style that is very personality dependent. So when you're leading a team, this style will look at the individual's personalities and lead them in accordance to those personalities. And here are some characteristics that he put forth. The first is theoretical. So you are somebody who will be developing knowledge or seeking knowledge for the sake of having knowledge. So you're motivated by the attainment of more knowledge. The next type of motivation is utilitarian. So effectively, you are most interested in what is useful. So you might be interested in earning more money and spending less time earning it. The next one is aesthetic. So you want to enjoy beautiful things. So somebody in, in your team as a leader may be motivated by having a pretty office, uh, a company car, the latest phone. Another aspect is social. So this kind of person will always wish to help others and they thrive better in a service based role and also where they're working in a team and they're actually feeling useful in the team. 
Another personality type is individualistic. So this person wishes to assert themselves. They are focused on what is in it for them and they want to be effectively known as somebody who is decisive and who can lead the pack. And the final personality type is traditional. This person is prioritizing and following a system of values. Now, this doesn't mean it has to be somebody who's motivated by the values of the organization, but the values are important to them. So if you have a member of your team that is very traditional, they will maybe look at their personal values and how their values are being reflected in the job that they're doing. So you can motivate them by showing them how their values are being reflected. Now here are five key practices in the different styles of leadership that you can have. The first is to model the way. So you are somebody who walks the talk. So if you are a manager or a leader who expects your employees to take time off over the weekend, then you will also take time off over the weekend. Another practice is to be inspirational. So you share your vision, you employ others to live your vision, and you share in a way that is inspirational to people so they will automatically fall behind you and get the job done. The fifth practice is to challenge the process. So this means that you will take a few risks, you'll experiment a bit more, and you're constantly innovating and changing and developing the organization, its processes and its outputs. The fourth practice is to enable others to act. This means that you are strengthening each of the people in your team and you are creating a collaboration between them. And the fifth practice of leadership and management is to encourage the heart. So it basically means that when you have a victory in the organization, you celebrate it, you recognize individuals and their contributions, and you basically allow your team to celebrate what they've achieved. Going back to Goldman's leadership styles, the different repertoires we covered were visionary, coaching, affiliative, democratic, pace setting and commanding. And the idea here is that an emotionally intelligent leader will be the kind of leader who will be able to apply each of these in the environment they best fit. So they will know when to be more commanding or when to coach. They will know when to tell their subordinates, the team members, what to do or when to encourage them to find the solutions for themselves. They'll be able to set a vision in a moment when a vision is needed and actually be democratic when a democratic decision is needed. So it basically means that when you're a leader of people or a leader of yourself, your skill set is actually more dynamic than it is one, one direction focused. For this part of the module, you have some leadership you have some leadership reading to do. So the reading that you need to do, or the, the documents entitled From Financial Services to Mount Everest, an interview with Felix Berg, conducted by Helena Plainart. Once you've done the reading, you'll need to discuss the fact that Felix Berg's business operates across different cultures. So can you think of examples of how awareness of the dimensions defined by Hofstede can be important in situations of interaction between Felix Berg and his constituencies? And the constituencies are the Swiss employees of the Summit Club, the freelance mountain guides, the local support personnel, the clients, and the members of the constituencies amongst themselves. So what you need to discuss is how can the um, dimensions defined by Hofstede be used to look at how the discussions between Felix Berg and the individual constituencies happen and also between the constituents, constitu constituency members themselves. So to look at the uh, Hofstede model, Hofstede has defined five dimensions along the behaviours that differ across cultures. And when I'm reading through um, these five dimensions, think about what applies in the culture that you are in. So is your culture more in individualistic or collectivist? So are people more focused on what they want for themselves as individual people, or are they focused more on what is needed for the good of the group or the team or the wider society? When it comes to power, do people respect power? Do they respect their leaders or do they tolerate their leaders? When it comes to uncertainty, do they accept that uncertainty exists or do they avoid uncertainty altogether and not take any risks? 
when it comes to goal achievement in your society, are people generally more aggressive towards achieving their goals or are they more passive towards achieving their goals? So do they, do they focus on achieving goals and will want to achieve them no matter what? Or do they not have that kind of um, objective and they decide actually the goals will happen when the goals are going to happen? And when it comes to outlook on life and outlook on business, do they work towards something long term or do they set themselves short term goals? One of the most important things that you can do as a leader with your style is to communicate openly. Now, communication has very different forms. In this section, we'll look at how do you tell your people what is important, so the vision, and where we're going. So where are we going? What is our vision? How are we going to get there? What do we have to focus on and what can we let go of? So you can communicate this vision by using a value statement, a vision statement, and a mission statement. The value statement will determine or will, will look at what are the main values of our company or our organization, so what values do we live by. The vision statement will look at the bigger vision of the organization, so what are we trying to achieve overall. And the mission statement is basically saying what will we do to get there and what does it look like when we eventually get there. And we'll look at some examples of these in a moment. But how do you think that these are all quite different? Because if on the face of it, they could all actually sound the same. But when you look at the three communications tools, the value statement, the vision statement, and the mission statement, which of the expectations of the members of the team of the organization are met by each of those tools? So when you think about personal integrity of the people, how is personal integrity achieved through each of those statements? What about clear direction? Where do team members get clear direction from? Is it from the vision statement, the, vision, the value statement, or the mission statement? In terms of motivation, how much are individuals motivated by a value statement, or a vision statement, or a mission statement? Which one is the most motivational? And when it comes to expertise, and their, what, the, what expertise they need to apply, where do you think they will find the most relevant when it comes to application of their expertise. Is it in the value statement, the vision statement, or the mission statement? What do you think? Now we looked at different theories of management and how this management and leadership styles can, can fall into five different ways of being. So we looked at modeling the way and walking the talk, being inspirational and sharing a vision for the future, being challenging, so you are focused on innovation and risk-taking. You look at enabling, which is effectively fostering collaboration within your teams by strengthening other people. And the final one is to encourage, so this is to celebrate victories. And when you look at the value statement, the vision statement and the mission statement, which of these practices on the, on the left, which of the five practices where do, they, where do they sit best? Do they all sit in the value statement? Do some of them sit in the vision statement or do some of them sit in the mission statement? What do you think? Let's now look at an example of a value statement. So this is a hotel chain and they have six key values. The first is hospitality. So they're passionate about delivering exceptional guest experiences. The next one is integrity, where they do the right thing all the time. The next is leadership. They are leaders in our in, in their in, so they're saying we are leaders in our industry and in our communities. The next is teamwork. They are team players in everything they do. The next is ownership. They are, we are the owners of our actions. And finally, their final value is now. We operate with a sense of urgency. How do you think values like this are applied in an organization? Now let's look at the vision statement of this hotel. Their vision statement is to fill the earth with the light and warmth of hospitality. That's a large, very all-encompassing vision statement. And their mission statement is to be the preeminent global hospitality company, the first choice of guests, team members and owners alike. Now that you've seen an example of a vision statement, a mission statement and a value statement, do you see clearly the difference between the three? Take a look at 
this example of a value statement from, sorry, a mission statement from a boutique strategic consultancy. Have a read of it and we will in a moment look at their values and vision statement and see if you can spot what the main differences are. Now that you've seen some examples of a value statement, a mission statement and a vision statement, it's time to create some of your own. So now this is a moment for a group exercise. What I'd like you to do is create a short vision and mission statement for the Summit Club or any other company of your choice. Now consider how this will come across towards the people in your organisation and which of, which, what each statement will actually address. So how you present this information is first of all you want to present the company. So you either choose Summit Climb or a different company. The next thing to do is to write your vision and mission statements on the whiteboard and explain how you think they inspire the constituencies and explain which constituencies they inspire and how you avoided including things that could be misunderstood by some of the constituencies. Then there'll be time for some feedback from the professor and from the class for each statement. Once you've gone through the feedback, in groups, what I'd like you to do is to create an improved version of the vision and mission statement based on your feedback, and then you present the improved versions. One important aspect of especially modern day leadership and leadership styles is storytelling in communication. So let me read out what's on this screen. You tell me if this is a story or just facts. Ferruccio Lamborghini, an Italian manufacturing magnate, founded automobile Ferruccio Lamborghini SPA in 1963 to compete with established marquees, including Ferrari. Can you actually see a story forming there? Or is it just facts? Is there any emotion in it? Or are you just being told very simple things that are factual on a timeline? Now let's look at a different version of that statement and see if you can tell the difference between what's factual and what's a story. Ferruccio was originally a farmer who made tractors. His business was very successful and he was amongst the most wealthy in Italy. He owned a Ferrari amongst other supercars. The Ferrari used to give him constant trouble. Now being a mechanic, he tried to fix the problem himself and he found out that his Ferrari had the same clutch as was used in one of his tractors. So Ferruccio went to the service guys regularly to have a clutch rebuilt or to renewed and every time the car was taken away for several hours and he wasn't able to watch it being repaired. The problem with the clutch was never cured, so Ferruccio decided to talk to Enzo Ferrari himself. Ferrari, he said, your cars are rubbish. But Ferrari was absolutely furious. He said, Lamborghini, you may be able to drive trucks well, but you'll never be able to handle a Ferrari properly. And this is how Ferruccio Lamborghini decided to make the perfect car and started his business. Now an activity for you here to analyse what is storytelling is to discuss why is the first version the facts, not a story? So what's in a story and what are in just facts and what's the difference? So what does it make the first one just facts and not story? Then discuss what additional, uh, additional elements does the story form contain in addition to the facts form? So can you see the facts being in the story? What else is in the story? The third thing I'd like to discuss is which elements are contained in the facts form but not in the story form and could they actually be added to the story form and what value would they add? And the final thing that I'd like you to discuss in your groups is if you were selling Lamborghinis, would you use the story? Why would you or why would you not? Now, when we look at the storytelling style of communicating, there are some key conclusions that we can draw. The first thing is that the essence of a story is actually quite short. The stories can convey humour, they can contain an element of surprise, and they're actually really great at being used to open up association spaces. 
So when it comes to a story containing an element of surprise and a story being well suited to open up association spaces, what do you think are the strengths of these two things? And what do you think are the risks when it comes to communicating in business? Now let's try a little exercise in storytelling. I think you're going to really enjoy it. So in your groups, what I'd like you to do is choose an organization, whether it's a summit club or another company, and you're going to illustrate some of the values, the vision, and the mission of the summit club, where you're going to tell the story to either a new employee, so you want them to understand what the company is about, give them direction, and inspire and motivate them, or you can choose a prospective client of the business. You want to impress them and make them want to take part in the contract. And once you've selected one person that you want to be presenting to, you'll then create a story that reflects the values, vision and mission of the organisation of your choice. Then as a group, what I'd like you to do is tell the story. So you have to be clear on the company that you've chosen and then tell the story. Then you'll receive feedback from your group. So did the story actually work? Was it emotional? Did it have an element of surprise? Then, and this will be the fun part, I think, is have a competition and you all vote for who created the best and most convincing story. Now, even though you as a leader, have, even if you have a very clear communication, you're very inspirational, you're very motivational, despite all of these efforts, one thing that can stand in the way of your message being accepted is a lack of trust. So how did you as a leader build that trust? For example, what you have to do is be able to at least be consistent and reliable. So walk the talk. When you want to have something done, make sure you can actually do it yourself. But also, for example, like I said earlier, if you are a leader who tells the team or encourages your team to take the weekend off, lead by example, walk the talk and take the weekend off yourself. The other thing you can do to build trust is to emphasize similarity. So allow your people to know that you are all part of the same team. That will strengthen your communication when you do eventually speak to your teams. So we looked at some frameworks earlier. We looked at modeling the way, inspiring, challenging, enabling, and encouraging others. When you look at each of these practices, which of them best builds trust first? And which of them builds on trust has already been established? Do you remember these nine characteristics of a secure based leader? So a secure based leader stays calm, accepts the individual, sees the potential, uses listening and inquiry, delivers a powerful message, focuses on the positive, encourages risk taking, inspires through intrinsic motivation and signals accessibility. Can you think of how each of these characteristics are used to build trust? Now, when we look at trust being built, we both have a we have both an analytical side to our brain or the left brain and a more intuitive side of the brain, the right brain. And oftentimes the left brain is associated with works with numbers, picking up language, logical thinking. And the right brain is associated with intuition, with images and with creativity. When you are an effective leader, you must be able to use both, not just in order to lead well and to notice these um, strengths of either left or right brain performance in others, but also to manage yourself and self-lead. And it's possible that we are more likely to be either more left-brained or more right-brained. There are some modern theories that say that we use both sides of our brain equally, but unfortunately we don't have time to go into that in this particular module. We're going to, going to go into the DISC model shortly, but before we do, let me talk you through an exercise that I'd like you to do in groups of two. So somebody who's a line manager will often, for example, coach people to help them perform even better than they're already performing, but people will react in different ways. So you as a leader have to adapt your communication, your personality style 
to their personality style so that when you are supporting people and challenging people, you're doing it in a way that they will welcome it. So in your exercise or in your group of two, you are going to choose a color from the disc model. So this will be the predominant behavioral preference of the person that you're about to coach as a line manager. You will define a background story for both characters that explain why the direct report is being coached and what the objective is for the coaching. And what I'd like you to do then is create a script of a short conversation between the two where the line manager is aware of the disc profile of the direct report and is adapting their coaching style to that, but also will act as a secure base leader. And then what I'd like you to do is to present your scripts. Now let's take a look at the DISC model. The DISC model has four key areas and they are highlighted in colors. And effectively, we as personalities will be more dominant in one area than the other. So blue is more cautious, more systematic and more analytical. A red behavioral preference is somebody who's more goal orientated. They could be quite determined and competitive, but also maybe a little bit aggressive. A green behavioral preference is somebody who's very relaxed, they're very supportive, but they're also sometimes very resistant to change. And somebody who has a yellow behavioral preference is very enthusiastic and sociable. They're also quite persuasive and inspiring. What I'd like you to do now is look at this particular exercise. So this is a right brain exercise exploring trust. Now in pairs, what I'd like you, each of you to do is to sketch a drawing or even several ideas that represent the concept of trust and make sure the partner you're working with can't see the sketch or drawing that you've done. Once you've completed it, individually show your drawing to your classmate and watch their spontaneous reaction to your particular drawing. And then the other person will, will, will repeat the same thing. And once you're done, present to the class the drawing that you've done and your partner will say what it is they saw and you will talk about what you actually intended to show in that drawing when you were drawing something around trust. And then in the debriefing part of the exercise, have a look at what worked well, what messages came across, what would you have done differently and how would you use this exercise in a team that you lead. Now let's have a look at leadership in different organizational structures. So the traditional organizational structure had a leader at the top and all the subordinates that are reporting into the leader. And a non-traditional representation of this is to have all the subordinates of the workers reporting into the leader. Are there other forms of representation of this particular traditional leadership model that you can see? Now, traditional organizational structures do have their downsides. Let's say in around 1978, the deputy of a department leader said to him, you're my boss, you have to motivate me. And the department leader replied with, huh? Now, in this particular story, the department leader was forming the F1, 2, 3, 4, or F5 of this particular leadership model. And he told his friends and family how outrageous he, it was that his, de his department leader didn't think that he could actually um, be responsible for motivating his, his subordinates. And the department leader equally went to his friends and said, I think it's utterly outrageous that the person that's in my team expects me to motivate them. So based on this particular story, what do you think of the downsides of this traditional representation of organizational structure? Now, in this particular story, the department leader didn't expect for him to motivate people. He expected the instructions that he set to be followed by people and for this to result in high quality work. He worked hard himself. He was very dedicated to the mission of the organization. And he may have been a bit of a control personality that had a bit of a temper. Now, he was definitely able to tell his subordinates what to do. And maybe he led out of fear. 
So when you think about this particular leadership style, do you think he was a secure based leader or not? Now let's have a look at a traditional structure represented in a traditional way for an organization. You effectively have the general manager or the CEO, or the owner at the top. You have a leadership team underneath that person and that leadership team have all have teams of their own. It looks like quite a complicated structure. Now, when it comes to leadership, who does the GM lead? And who does the people positioned in F1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 lead? Do E1, 2, 3 also have leadership roles? How is the responsibility of leadership distributed across this particular organizational structure? You'll remember, you'll remember that earlier we talked about the intercultural aspects of leadership from Hofstede, and I asked you to think about with these five dimensions, how do they, how are they represented in your culture? So is your culture more individualistic or collectivist? Is there a, more of a respect of power or tolerance of power? Is uncertainty accepted or is it avoided? Is there aggressive behavior towards a goal or passive behavior? And when people plan, do they plan long-term or do they plan short-term? Now let's take a look at the way people lead each other. We have a CFO and a CEO of a small consulting company in Zurich. The graph on the left represents the disk styles of the CEO and the graph on the right represents the disk styles of the CFO. Now, as you can see, red is highly, highly present in the CEO. This person is generally more goal oriented, very determined, potentially aggressive. The blues, you'll remember, are somebody who's very cautious, very analytical and very systematic, which makes sense that somebody in a CFO position, in a financial position, would have this as their dominant style. And just to remind you, the yellow style is more persuasive, inspiring and sociable, potentially a little disorganised. And the green is somebody who's more relaxed and more patient and potentially resistant to change. So when you look at these two profiles, the CEO on the left and CFO on the right, what do you think are their strengths and weaknesses? What do you think could be the potential issues that occur between the two? And how do you think the CEO should lead the CFO? What characteristics from that DISC profile could the CEO lead from? And equally, how can the CFO lead the CEO? What characteristics from the CEO's DISC profile can the CFO work on? Let's have a look at a leadership case study. So SPS, Smart Professional Services, is a mid-sized Swiss professional services company. It was founded by Peter Maley. He's the main shareholder of the company and he holds most of the equity. He leads the company with a semi-patriarchal, semi-democratic style. He's an extrovert personality who likes to be around people. And while he can be decisive, he actually doesn't like conflict. So his decision-making style is a mix of analytical and intuitive. Now, since being founded, the company has grown to a size of about 100 employees, which, is about 80, which makes about 85 of them as consultants that provide professional services to clients, and the rest perform various corporate and support functions. The company now has four levels of hierarchy. Mr. Maley is the CEO. There's a management team of five, consisting of the heads of the five offices, and team leaders, supporting, and team leaders reporting to them, and they, they also have teams reporting into them as well. So let's do an exercise around that case study. Okay, so you'll you'll split yourself into two groups and you, I'd like you to imagine Mr. Maley, who will be played by your professor, has retained both teams to create a concept for measures to take to ensure good leadership at SPS. After the concepts will be presented, Mr. Maley will choose with which team he'll work in the future. So basically you are competing to acquire Mr. Maley as your client. Now amongst yourself discuss what questions you should ask Mr. Maley before you formulate the concept. Now in the plenary, you'll need to ask your questions to Mr. Maley, who will be played by your professor.
Now, in your two groups, create a concept after the question has been answered and prepare to present it on the whiteboard. So Mr. Mainly knows nothing about the leadership frameworks, but you do. So use your expertise and present your arguments. And in the plenary, present your final concept and Mr. Mainly, your professor, will choose a winning team. Let's have a slight reality check. Because most modern writings about leadership talk about how you need to bring the best out of yourself and from others. But when this theory is applied to real life, many people will say, actually, you're not able to do that all the time. And one person who thought this way was Machiavelli, who said, it is better to be feared than loved if you cannot be both. And Machiavelli also said, any man who tries to be good all the time is bound to come to ruin among the great numbers who are not good. Hence, a prince who wants to keep his authority must learn how not to be good and use that knowledge or reflect for, refrain from using it as necessity requires. What do you think about that? Do you think it's possible to always try to bring out the best in yourselves and in others? Or do you think Machiavelli was right and you have to be a little bit bad sometimes? Let's have a look at some new forms of work and of leadership. What do you think they are? Now, when we look at technology, we can really see that it enables virtual teams. This is one of the new forms of work and it creates new ways of leading. But do you think it's a good way to work together? Yahoo a few years ago decided that actually speed and quality are sacrificed when people work from home. And they created the concept of one Yahoo, which effectively means people will be working physically together. But then this created some conflict in the industry where Donald Trump wrote on Twitter that Marissa Mayer is right to expect Yahoo employees to come to the workplace versus working from home. She's doing a great job. But Richard Branson later wrote that to successfully work with other people, you have to trust each other. And a big part of this is trusting people to get their work done wherever they are without supervision. So when it comes to technology enabling virtual teams, do you think that a great way of working together is working virtually, or do you think it's better to work physically in the same building? And this brings us to the end of this module on leadership styles.